In a little over 24 hours, the 2024 Sweet 16 will officially kick off. And even though I personally love the first weekend and the first two rounds of March Madness the most, there's something super special about the Sweet 16, especially this year. In the round of 32, favorites went 15 and one, making for a super chalky Sweet 16. And although that is a bummer for us that love chaos and upsets and Cinderella stories, it has created absolutely incredible matchups of high level basketball in these next eight games. So let's get right into it. This is everything you need to know going into the Sweet 16. Game one, two seed Arizona versus six seed Clemson. Let's start with the Clemson Tigers. They are a team that I've said before, I'm shocked to see in the Sweet 16. However, after watching their tape in their Baylor and New Mexico wins, it's not hard at all to see why they are in this position. They have actually led in every minute of play besides the first 40 seconds of round one versus New Mexico in this tournament. I think the most likely reason why people didn't really like Clemson is they don't play the flashiest style of basketball. It also doesn't help they lost to Boston College, a 20 and 16 overall team in the first round of the ACC tournament by 20 points. But that is a mistake that we sometimes make going into March Madness. We overweigh the impact of conference tournaments. A lot of teams that make a run and win their conference tournament aren't necessarily necessarily the hottest team in March Madness, especially if they aren't a bid stealer. According to Ken Palm, Clemson ranks 23rd overall in adjusted efficiency, which is good for 15th out of the 16 Sweet 16 teams, only ahead of NC State. They're led by star big man PJ Hall, a 6'10 senior who can score on all three levels, but he has had a rough tournament so far, only playing in 39 of the 80 available minutes due to foul trouble. Senior guards Joseph Girard and Chase Hunter are key pieces for them as well. Girard is a Syracuse transfer who was a part of that 2021 11 seed Syracuse team to make the Elite Eight. He's a great shooter, shooting 41% from three on seven attempts per game game and averaging 15.3 points. He's also leading the nation in field goal percentage at 95%, which is crazy. Out of his 120 free throw attempts on the season, he's made 114. And then Chase Hunter, who is the MVP of the tournament for the Clemson Tigers so far. He's averaging 20 points per game, which is eight points above his regular season average. And he's also been phenomenal on the defensive end. So in order for Clemson to win this game versus Arizona, complete the upset and make their first elite eight since 1970 a couple things would need to happen number one pj hall cannot get in foul trouble for the third game in a row number two clemson has to dictate the pace of play in this game according to ken palm clemson plays at a very average tempo while arizona plays very fast thirdly they need chase hunter to continue playing at the level he has in his first two games and fourthly which is kind of tied to the first point they have to find a way to stop umar balo without getting pj hall in foul trouble i'll circle back to those points in a second, but let's talk about the Arizona Wildcats. They are the two seed in the West region. Ken Palm has them ranked fifth in adjusted efficiency margin, ninth in offense and 10th in defense, which is very impressive. Caleb Love, the Pac-12 player of the year, the former North Carolina Tar Heel is their leading scorer at 18.1 points per game, but he's never been the most efficient shot maker. When Caleb Love is on, nobody can stop him. And when he's off, nothing can help him. Pella Larson is Arizona's second leading scorer tied with Umar Balo at 12.9 points per game. He's very efficient, shooting 44% from three, 60% effective field goal. But I think Clemson has wings to kind of neutralize him, which is why I said earlier, Umar Balo, the center for Arizona, he's seven feet tall, 260 pounds, creates the most significant mismatch for Clemson's defense. I'm unsure what Clemson is going to do here. If you put PJ Hall on him, you risk getting your best scorer and your best player in foul trouble. But your other big is Ian Shefflin, who's 6'8 and 225 pounds. Simply put, who Whoever wins this matchup and wins the pace of play is probably going to win this game. Obviously, Arizona is the favorite here. I like them. They're a super fun team. So please don't be offended if you're an Arizona fan. I just chose to go from the Clemson perspective because it's very easy to see how Arizona can win this game. Stay tuned to the end of this video, and I'll give you my prediction on each of these games. Game two, Connecticut, the number one overall seed versus five seed San Diego State. This is a rematch of the 2023 national title. And if we take a look at UConn and Ken Palm, you'll just see how dominant they've been this year. They're number one in adjusted EM, second in offense and eighth in defense. And the last time a team has had a 32 or above adjusted efficiency was 2021. Gonzaga and Baylor, who ironically both met each other 
other in the national title game with Baylor winning it all. SDSU, on the other hand, is ranked 17th in adjusted efficiency, 53rd in offense, 8th in defense. Conventional wisdom would tell you to have the Aztecs just slow the game down to a crawl and control it, but the Huskies thrive in that environment. Matter of fact, they are below average in adjusted tempo and average possession length. They shoot 57.2% from the field as a team. They turn the ball over at a super low rate, and they get an insane amount of offensive boards. UConn is currently on an eight-game double-digit win streak in the NCAA tournament dating back to 2023. The record is 2001 Michigan State with nine. Just an absolutely dominant run so far for Connecticut. Point guard Tristan Newton is their best player, averaging 15 points per game, 6.8 rebounds, and 6.2 assists. You have Cam Spencer, a sharp shooter, shooting 44% from three on six attempts per game. Alex Caraban, a versatile 6'7 wing, who's shooting 64% from inside the arc and 39% from outside. Big man Donovan Klingon, who averages 12.8 points per game on an extremely efficient 65% from the field. Oh yeah, and he's seven foot two. Let's say San Diego State somehow finds a way to stop all four of these guys. Well, then UConn has Stefan Castle, a freshman who is a projected lottery pick in the upcoming NBA draft. Dan Hurley's team is just absolutely loaded. The one thing I'll say about San Diego State is that Jaden Ledee is having an incredible tournament. He's averaging 29 points per game on incredibly efficient shooting numbers, but I just don't think he has enough scoring talent around him to hang with UConn, even if they were to play pretty well on defense. That's all I got on game number two. Game three, one seed North Carolina versus four seed Alabama. The Tar Heels are ranked ninth overall in Ken Palm adjusted efficiency, 17th in offense and sixth in defense. While Alabama ranks third worst out of the Sweet 16 teams at 14th, fourth in offense and 101st in defense. Simply put, Alabama is living and dying by their offense and their ability to score at a high rate. It's their identity. They're going to beat you by scoring more points than you. They're eighth in adjusted tempo, meaning they love to run, but UNC isn't that far behind them at 41st in the nation. They can run if they want to as well. This game has the highest total of any in the Sweet 16 and is a whopping 19 points higher than the second highest total on this slate, Gonzaga Purdue at 154.5. In Bama's first round matchup, they gave up a whopping 96 points to the College of Charleston. Now they scored 109, so that's great, but Charleston ranks the 178th defense in the nation. Meanwhile, the Tar Heels rank six. After looking into it more, Bama is three and seven this year versus teams with a top 40 defensive rating on Ken Palm. With one of those wins being last week versus Grand Canyon in the round of 32, I will say Mark Sears is an absolute dog. He's averaging 21 points per game. He was also a freshman at the University of Ohio with Jason Preston in 2021 when they made a run to the round of 32. He's shooting an absurd 43.5% from three on 5.6 attempts per game, giving him an incredible 59.9 effective field goal percentage. Bama loves to crash the offensive boards. They rank 26th in the nation, but North Carolina is the sixth best team in the nation at preventing offensive rebounds. I just think this is a bad matchup for Alabama. Could they win in a shootout 95 to 91? Absolutely. But the combination of guys like RJ Davis, who also averages 21 per game, Armando Baycott, and Harrison Ingram, I think will just be too much for Bama. Game four on this slate, the nightcap Thursday night. This is my favorite matchup of the Sweet 16, the Big 12 champions, the two seed Iowa State versus the Big 10 champions, the three seed Illinois, and more importantly, the number one defense in the country versus the number one offense in the country. Shout out to Andrew Weatherman for finding this, but this is actually just the 10th time since 2012, the first since 2021, that the number one Ken Palm offense is playing the number one Ken Palm defense. And it's been pretty even in the first nine matchups with the defense winning five out of nine. Iowa State's leading scorer is Keyshawn Gilbert, averaging 13.7 points per game. But the X factor for me is Taman Lipsy, point guard who is homegrown from Ames, Iowa, went to Ames High School. The Cyclones have a really balanced attack on offense and a cohesive defensive unit that has stifled teams. I mean, just look at their most recent game versus Houston. They beat them 67 to 41, which is crazy. They're fully capable of shutting down the best offenses in the nation. But some of the teams to have given them trouble are teams like BYU, Texas A&M, and even Baylor who have elite offenses and so-so defenses. But that's not to say that Iowa State can't win those games. They did drop a game to BYU 
you giving up 87 points early in the season which is super uncharacteristic but they bounce back versus BYU later in the season winning and only giving up 63 for the Illini they have one of the most talented scorers of the basketball in the nation in Terrence Shannon Jr a 6'6 wing who's averaging 23.3 points per game he's a very efficient scorer as well with a 56.6 effective field goal percentage and he's just completely relentless when getting to the rim but in my opinion the X factor for Illinois is their second leading scorer and Southern Illinois transfer Marcus Damask in their opening game he had the 10th ever triple double in NCAA history and I think he's going to be super important for handling this Iowa State defense now another thing about Illinois is they are extremely tall and long especially in their starting lineup which I think has a chance to give Iowa State some issues but Illinois has also lost two teams with somewhat comparable metrics to Iowa State like Michigan State earlier this year Sparty finished with the 11th ranked defense and 51st ranked offense which is remarkably worse than Iowa State when comparing but what it shows is that Illinois can be vulnerable to a team that's identity is on defense with offense being secondary I honestly have no idea yet who I like in this game and that's why it's the most fun game on the slate for me I'll decide by the end of the video both schools are looking to make their first elite eight run in decades Iowa State's last one was in 2000 versus Michigan State where they would lose to Mateen Cleaves' national title team. And then for Illinois, it would be the first time in the Elite Eight since 2005 when D. Brown led them to a national title game. Game five, our first game on Friday, two seed Marquette versus 11 seed NC State. The Wolfpack are the only double digit seed left in the tournament. And like I've said before, nobody expected them to be here either. They were a bid stealer who won the ACC tournament, giving them a berth into March Madness. NC State's by far the worst metric wise on this list, but that's to be expected with a team like this what they are now is not what they were for most of the year the Wolfpack are led by senior guard DJ Horn who averages 16.7 points per game and senior big man DJ Burns who averages 12.8 Horn has had quite the quiet tournament so far at least by his standards averaging 13 points per game meanwhile nobody has had an answer for DJ Burns who's averaging 20 and has went 7 for 11 and 9 for 12 from the field in his two games NC State needs the DJ Horn of the ACC tournament in order order to get past Marquette in this one. The Golden Eagles, however, rank 13th on Ken Palm, and they're a very balanced team, 19th in offense, 21st in defense, led by their leading scorer, Cam Jones, and star point guard, Tyler Kolick. Cam is averaging 17.1 points per game this year on 41.4% from three. Meanwhile, Tyler Kolick is averaging 15.3 points per game, 7.9 assists, and 4.8 rebounds. To me, he's the best point guard in the nation right now. I am somewhat curious how they're going to guard DJ Burns. Marquette's big man, Oso Igadar is 6'9", 205. Maybe they put David Joplin on who's 6'7", 215 and just try to front him. I'm not really sure how Shaka Smart will decide to attack this, but I do see that as a mismatch in favor of the Wolfpack. However, Marquette's offense has been extremely efficient in this tournament. In their win versus Colorado, they shot 70 plus percent from the field in the first half. And I just don't see how NC State is going to keep up with that type of offense. Like I stated earlier, they really need DJ Horn to step up and have a game like he did in the ACC Championship defeating North Carolina and scoring 29 points. Game six of the Sweet 16, number one seed Purdue versus five seed Gonzaga. We'll start with Gonzaga, a team that people foolishly, myself included, yes, I am ashamed about this, were picking to get upset by McNeese State, a team that played absolutely nobody during the regular season. Mark few teams just simply do not get upset in the first round. I mentioned this in one of my previous recaps, but Gonzaga under Mark Few has only been upset twice in the first round and one of those times was in 2008 against someone you may have heard of Stephen Curry. Now it's one thing to make it past the first round, even the second round, but it is a whole nother thing matching up against a team like Purdue. I know what you're thinking. Purdue has this stigma especially after losing to a 16 seed last year. But this team is just not the same team as 2023 by every available metric. If we take a look at their adjusted efficiency margin on Ken Palm, last year when they got upset as a one seed, they were 23.24, good for seventh in the nation. This year, they're 30.51. And just to show you how good of a number north of 30 is for Ken Palm, it is incredibly rare for three teams or more to be above that threshold in any given season. Matter of fact, it's 
happened just in five seasons over the past 25 years. Purdue has the third best offense in the nation and the 15th best defense. And obviously a huge part of that offense is the reigning player of the year, Zach Eady. He demands so much attention with every touch he gets in the post. These are the first teams in our Sweet 16 matchups to have played in the regular season. It was only their fourth and fifth game of the year, but they did play in the Maui Invitational with Purdue winning 73 to 63. Both teams shot poorly from three. And since then, Gonzaga has shifted to a three big starting lineup, which I think could be an interesting wrinkle to this game. Graham EK is Gonzaga's leading scorer, a transfer from Wyoming. And he's obviously a huge X factor for Gonzaga pulling off this upset. Most likely he's drawn the tough task of guarding Zach Eady, a player who draws the most foul calls in college basketball. But honestly, EK is an absolute bucket in his own right on the offensive end. And he's a huge reason why Gonzaga has the seventh best offense in the nation. He's averaging 16.4 points per game, 7.3 rebounds on 61.2% from the field. Then you have fifth year senior Anton Watson for Gonzaga, who averages 14 points per game and seven boards as well. And what's different about him is that he's been here before. He was on that 2021 Jalen Suggs team that made a national title. On the Purdue side, we all know about Zach Eady. He's averaging 24 and 12. Braden Smith, sophomore point guard, averaging 12 points per game on 44% from three with seven assists and 5.7 rebounds, which is pretty crazy for a little guy like him. He's already established himself this season in that upper echelon of point guards, but I think this is a massive spot for Braden Smith to put himself on the map nationally and into a conversation with guys like Tyler Kolick and Tristan Newton. This game's probably going to come down to foul trouble and who gets into it first. If EK does, the game probably is over for Gonzaga. If ED somehow does it could smell trouble for Purdue. Lastly, one cool tidbit I found about these two teams is that Zach Eady and Graham EK are first and second in the nation according to Ken Palm in individual offensive rating. So it's safe to say you are going to see some exquisite big man traditional offense in this game. Game seven, number one seed Houston versus number four seed Duke. I'm not gonna lie guys, I'm a little worried about Houston after that Texas A&M game. I told you guys it was going to be close and if the Cougars draw an officiating crew that likes to be whistle happy. I don't think it bodes well for them. Houston has the second best defense in the country. They also are second in Ken Palm adjusted efficiency margin at 31.58 and they have the 14th best offense. They play very slow. They love to play physical. LJ Cryer, a transfer from Baylor last season is their leading scorer, but Jamal Shedd overall is their best player and their leader. In my opinion, he's an absolute dog. He's averaging 13.2 points per game, 6.2 for assists. Sophomore guard Emmanuel Sharp has been having an incredible tournament, including fresh off a career high 30 versus Texas A&M. So don't get me wrong, guys. I do enjoy Houston. I think they have as good a chance as anybody to make a national title. There's just something about this Duke team and about this game that has me feeling uneasy if I was a Houston fan. Duke's freshman guard Jared McCain is fresh off a 30 bomb against what I think was a very good James Madison team. They beat by 40. Their leading score is seven feet tall, averaging 16 points per game in Kyle Filipowski. And senior guard Jeremy Roach has the incredible experience of making it to a Final Four in 2022. Plus, Duke's advanced metrics are actually really good as well. They're fifth best in offense, 19th best in defense, and sixth best overall. I don't know. I just have a feeling that Jared McCain is going to have one of those legacy runs. But I don't know. Maybe I'll be apologizing to all you Houston fans in our recap video tomorrow. Our final game of the day, and in my opinion, the second best game on this slate, number two seed Tennessee versus number three seed Creighton. In a world where Zach Eady doesn't exist, Tennessee has the player of the year in Dalton Connect. A transfer from Northern Colorado, he has been absolutely phenomenal this year. It does worry me the poor shooting night he had versus Texas in the round of 32, going five for 18 from the field, including one for eight from three. But he was able to get to the line going seven for eight and was still able to score 18 points. Plus, I've been trying to to figure out who on Creighton has the ability to guard him. Trey Alexander is probably going to draw the matchup, but he's about 6'4", so he is giving up some size in that matchup. And if we check out Tennessee's Ken Palm rankings, they're ranked 8th in the nation, 3rd best in defense, 29th in offense. Meanwhile, the Creighton Blue Jays are 11th overall with the 11th best offense and the 23rd best defense. In order for Creighton to win this game and have success, they are going to have to shoot the heck out of the ball from 3, but that's kind of Creighton 
Houston's MO in general for winning games, they attempt the most amount of threes per game compared to the rest of the 15 teams in the Sweet 16. And they're led by three-headed offensive monster in Baylor Shireman, a transfer from South Dakota State two years ago, who's averaging 18.3 points per game, 9.1 rebounds, four assists, and 38% from three on a massive 8.2 attempts per game. Junior guard Trey Alexander is averaging 17.7 points per game as well. And seven-foot big man Ryan Cockbrenner is averaging 17.4 points per game. A role player who was huge for them in their round of 32 win versus Oregon was Steven Ashworth, a 6'1 senior guard who averages 11 points per game. But Tennessee's big man Jonas Adu is my X factor in this game. I think his physicality can bother Ryan Kalkbrenner quite a bit. And as much as I like Creighton, I just don't see how this Tennessee defense doesn't wear them down. If Creighton wants to win, they're probably going to have to turn this into a shootout, which they are fully capable of doing. And who knows, maybe Maybe Tennessee's offense is just struggling in this tournament and the Texas game wasn't a one-off but more of a symptom of what's to come. So finally to recap with my predictions I didn't really plan on making predictions for this video but here we are in game one I'm going to go out on an absolute limb and pick Clemson to beat Arizona in the upset. Maybe this is because I watched too much Clemson film and research for this video, but I think Clemson has the ability to dictate the pace of play, slow it down, execute their sets in the half court, which they are great at doing. I think Chase Hunter is an excellent matchup on defense for Caleb Love, and PJ Hall is going to have a redemption game. It's going to be close, but I'm picking Clemson and you guys can make fun of me if I'm wrong. Game two is pretty much a no brainer for me. UConn steamrolls San Diego State. In game three, I think North Carolina narrowly beats Alabama. I'll say by four points. Game four, this is by far the hardest one for me. My heart wants to say Iowa State and I'm probably going to regret this because I love the Cyclones, but I'm going to go with Illinois. I think Illinois offense prevails in this one. I think Marcus to mass comes up huge. I think Iowa State's offense just doesn't have enough juice to keep up maybe there's a five to six minute stretch where they just go completely scoreless or one field goal and that's all the Illini need to build out an eight to nine point lead that Iowa State just cannot get back game five Marquette versus NC State I'm gonna go Marquette here I have them making the final four this is a Tyler Kolick tournament and unfortunately I have them ending NC State's magical sweet 16 run game six Purdue versus Gonzaga I think Purdue wins this game by seven or eight points but i do think graham ek puts up like 25 and tries to keep it close for gonzaga game seven houston versus duke again i could look very foolish here and i'm okay with being wrong houston could blow the brakes off of duke but i'm picking duke to win this game i'm betting on a great game from jared mccain i think this game comes down to the last possession but i think the blue devils prevail and jared mccain just seems to be the type of player to come up clutch in these moments and game eight finally tennessee versus Craig. I have Tennessee winning this one. I think Dalton Connect will just not be denied, and he's going to show why he is the second best player in the nation behind Zach Eady in this game. Plus, I think Tennessee's defense will stifle Creighton's offense just enough to eke this one out. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did making it. I will be doing recaps for the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight, but instead of daily, it's going to be one video for the Sweet 16 and one video for the Elite Eight. That way, we have enough to talk about in the video. If you enjoyed this video and you haven't checked out my daily recaps for the first two rounds of March Madness, check that out here. Start with day one and go all the way to day four if you so wish. Thanks for watching, guys. This past week has been absolutely incredible for me. And as always, we'll see you on the hardwood.